Good morning, Luke 418 Fellowship. It is a joy to be with you today, and we have a God that is the ancient of days, and he was and is and is to come, and, and that is something to be praised. So today we're going to lift up our voices and give him an offering of praise. We're going to sing blessing and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Ancient of days. Sing blessing and honor. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be to the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. His kingdom shall reign forever and ever and ever. Let's sing your king. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days, for none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Every tongue, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship you will be exalted, O God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O ancient of days. Let's sing that again. Your kingdom shall reign. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing to the ancient of days. Kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Yes, Jesus, sing to the ancient of days. Amen. For none can compare to your matchless work. Sing to the ancient of days. Sing to the ancient of days. Sing to the ancient of days. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, 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 so great. Lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujah To Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find And other is so loving So good and kind He lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today He walks with me and talks with me Along life's narrow way
lives in our hearts and we sing to him, he is the king. He needs to be on the throne of our lives. Sing to the king who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the lamb that was slain. Life and salvation, his empire shall bring. And joy to the nations when Jesus is king. Sing that again. Sing to the king who is coming. Father, we just want to tell you that we love you tonight. And then we want to glorify your name in every circumstance that people would see uh, our love and know that it is from you. And we give the, this to you as an offering this morning. Amen. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glory
together. Heavenly Father, we know that you are holy. There is no one that is like you, and there never will be anyone like you, Lord. You're the great I am. Past, present, and future, we know that we can rely on you because of the love that you have for us. 
We thank you for your son. We thank you for the sacrifice that he made for us on a tree at Calvary. We pray that we would share that with others, Lord, and, and that this offering of praise was pleasing to you. The fruit of our lips continually professing your name, Lord. We pray that as the message is brought, that our hearts would be ready and that we'd be open to what you are trying to tell us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Aaron. What a wonderful time of lifting praise to our Father. Let me just take just a moment and welcome each one of you uh, to Luke 418 Fellowship via Facebook Live, YouTube, and live stream. It is a joy that you would be a part. I am excited today as we continue in the summer series on community. This is our fifth of six weeks that we're going to be talking about in community. And if you have the Bible app, would you take that app, open up the Version Bible app, and you'll see the notes today. I didn't put blanks in there. It's just you'll see each and individual uh, point, and then you can kind of write notes underneath that, and you can follow along with us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before your throne and we praise your holy name. Lord, we are all across this city right now in living rooms, different homes, but we are united together by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I am so thankful that in Acts chapter 2, that you founded the church, not in a building, but in people, in believers. Father, I pray that we would just continue to remember that your sanctuary is inside each of us and that you dwell through the power of the Holy Spirit with us. Father, this morning, as many are dealing with COVID-19 from an economical situation or to literally the physical virus and, and fighting it because they have tested positive, Lord, we pray for healing in the name of Jesus but we pray that no matter what each person is walking through, that they will have peace because the steadfast of mind you keep in perfect peace, Father, because our trust is in you. Father, you are our healer. And so we continue to, to just hold on to you. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil for you are with us. And so right now, in each home, where each person is, Father, I am just so thankful to know that you are with them and you are here with us. Father, we love you so much. And we pray today that your word, your breath goes forth. The word of God, your word will not return void. It says that, that your word is quick and, and sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts through the bone and marrow all the way to the heart, to the soul. And it says that every person is laid bare before your word. And so, Father, today, may your breath go forth. May your words go forth. May we have ears to hear and a heart to obey. Father, empty me. Get me out of the way. And just let it be your words, for it's in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I am excited about continuing our journey on community. We've talked about how we must have roots that are deep. If you remember the oak trees that I talked about here in Mobile and how the roots are a representation, or excuse me, the tree is a representation of its root system. You have a healthy root system, you have a healthy tree. And so we are called to abide in Christ. We talked about how we must counsel biblically with one another, how we're called to pursue one another relationally. How we must confess our sins to one another as we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today, we're going to continue in this journey. 
Have you ever struggled with just longing to tell somebody how it is? You want to let them know how wrong they are. Have you ever blasted somebody by saying, I'm going to let you have it? Did you ever hear the enemy whisper that said, you're a failure? You've really messed up. Have you ever attempted to argue to prove that you're right? Have you ever asked a brother to join in on a pity party that you're walking through? Has there ever been a time where maybe you were in a room with somebody and you were struggling with that person and and arguing with that person, so when that person came in the room, you're like, I'm just going to slip out because I'm not even going to be around that person right now? If you've had any of these feelings, if you've had any of these thoughts or actions, this message today is for you and for me. We need to to not just have an intellectual understanding of the truth, but we need to live out the power of the truth of the Word of God. We must live that out through us. We must apply God's Word in our lives. We must care about God and others to have the weighty and respectful conversations for the good of others and for the glory of God. We need to be whole, complete, and mature in Christ. This morning, we're going to continue our series and we're going to look at what the Word of God calls us and how the Word of God calls us to instruct, to teach, and to warn one another within community. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to look at just two verses, verse 28 and 29, the last two verses of Colossians 1. It says this, We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Wow, what a powerful, powerful passage. Let's ask the Lord just to open our eyes to hear and see what he's speaking. Father, thank you for your word. Now may we see and hear. May we shema, listen and obey your words. Father, we love you. Amen. As we continue in this journey in community, remember there are three major foundations that we must continue to hold on to as we look at each applicable point of community. First is is that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and will always be in perfect unity and community together. The second is is that we were created in Imago Dei in the image of God, which means that we were created to reflect the image and the character of God. We were created to reflect the image and character of God. And the third thing was, is that God is the source of life. There is no life apart from God. And there is no community apart from God. Everything that we have taught on during this journey in community has been founded on the fact that God's in perfect unity and community, that we were created in His image to reflect His character and image, and that only God is the source of life and community. Today we're going to specifically look at what does it mean to admonish one another. We see in verse 28, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. The first thing that we must ask is what does the word admonishment mean? You know, when you think about admonishment, the first thoughts that may come to your mind is right and wrong. Hey, you're doing that wrong. Hey, you're doing that right. It may be a simple, very legalistic view of just uh, correcting a brother or sister. 
The definition of admonishment means to instruct, to correct, and or to warn someone. Let me kind of paint it in a picture for you. When you were a kid, And you were working on something, uh, you were trying to do something, and you were not able to accomplish what you were attempting to do. Your parent could basically address you three different ways. One, your parent could say, hey, listen, you're way too young for that. You just need to stop doing it. You don't need to, uh, to, to try that. Like, just stop. Some of you, that may have been what you heard quite often. Your parent may also have said, you know what, instead of you doing that, let me just do it. Let me just, let me just take this out of your hands. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take care of it. And then you can come and you can uh, finish whatever's there. The parent may have said, you know, like, listen, you, you stop and let me just do it. But the third way that a parent could address a child who's struggling in a situation is, hey, let me come alongside and instruct you and walk with you, and teach you how to do that. You know, one of the first things I think about as a young kid was my dad coming alongside of me and teaching me how to change a flat tire. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't want to learn. But now that I'm an adult, I'm so thankful that he walked alongside, instructed, guided, and taught me how to change a flat tire. See, the third way that a parent can respond to you is what it means to admonish somebody. That you come along, you correct, you teach, you warn them so that they can learn and they can grow. So the definition of admonishment is to correct, to instruct, or to warn. But here's the thing, we must realize that for us to truly admonish somebody, it must be biblical and from the right heart. And so the second thing that we want to look at today is one, the definition of admonishment, but the second thing is what is the heart behind admonishing one another? We see it right here in in Colossians 1 verse 28. It says, we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. And here it is, so that. You could even say like equal sign. We admonish and teach so that equals that they would be presented, every man complete in Christ. So what is the heart behind admonishing one another? The heart behind it is that they would be made complete in Christ. So how do we long and desire for somebody to be made complete in Christ? It's that we love and care for one another. If we love somebody and we care for somebody and we're thinking of their best interest in mind, then we're going to long for them to be complete in Christ. It's not going to be about right and wrong and and you did this wrong and you did this wrong and I can't believe you did this and you better do it this way. But it's going to be out of a heart for somebody to be complete in Christ. You know, our culture says love means all different things. Our culture tries to define love, and in reality, it never truly defines it. Because simply defined, our culture says that it's whatever it needs to be to get whatever I want. But the Bible gives us a clear definition of love. The Bible tells us that love defines who God is. In 1 John chapter 4, 8, it says... The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The Bible gives us a clear definition of love, that love is what has motivated God to sacrifice his son. John 3, 16, for God, what? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. In Romans 5, 8, one of my favorite verses, that God demonstrated his 
love. He put love into action. He demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It also says in 1 John 4, 9 through 11, it tells us that it's because of the love of God that it was by this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live. It was the love of God that has motivated, brought God to, to sacrifice his son for you and I. But love's also defined in the scripture as what brings us into God's family. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. It says this, in 1 John 3, 1, it says by, um, hang on one second, we'll get it. 1 John chapter 3, 1, it says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. We are called children of God because of his great love. You know, as a believer in Christ, it says that, that when we come to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that when we submit to Christ's lordship, that the tavern or the, the, the sanctuary of God comes to dwell within us. Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, which means the love of God is in us to be lived out through us. It's not something that we can create. It's not some feeling that we can put together. But it's what God is. God is love. See, our culture defines love in all these different directions, but ultimately wanting to get what, whatever they need. But God gives us a clear definition of love in the scripture. And see, even advertisements today use the word love in it because they realize how important that is in our lives. I mean, you've probably heard this, this, this jingle, I'm loving it. It's McDonald's, right? And they're using that because we know that love is very important. But here's the problem. You can put it in any advertisement that you want. And you can speak it all day long. But true love is going to produce an action. See, our culture says that if you, if you love me, then you won't, you won't speak against me. Uh, you'll accept exactly who I am. You're not going to... Uh, uh, you're going to be okay with anything. You're, you're just going to be, you're not going to say anything to me. They say that, that you need to accept me with no questions. But the Bible teaches us that love does not gloss over sin. The Bible teaches us that genuine love cannot turn a blind eye to sin. See, the heart behind a, a, an admonishment is that you love somebody so much that you're going to speak the word of God into their life so that they can be made complete in Christ. See, when you see something that a brother or sister is walking down a path of, true love is going to come alongside, instruct, teach, and warn them. Why? Because you care for them. One of my favorite verses, and, and really a difficult verse, is Ezekiel 33, verses 7 through 9. It says, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman for the house of Israel, so that you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hands. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. In 2 Timothy 2 and Galatians chapter 6, both are New Testament examples that we are called to speak to one another in love and gentleness. Why? Because we love and care for them that we want to warn somebody if they're walking down a path, we genuinely desire for them to be complete in Christ. See, Faithfully admonishing a brother or sister is from a heart of love. It's from a heart of care. We truly 
believe that there's no other way than living in harmony with one another in reverence of God, living worthy of our calling in Christ Jesus as the children of God. See, we believe that 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 is what is best for me. That's what's best for you is for us to be complete in Christ. And so we're going to walk accordingly and speak to one another, to instruct one another, to teach and to warn. When we love and care for one another, we admonish because we're building up a brother or sister in truth. It's not flattery. It's not harsh criticism. When we love and care for a brother, we're seeking to restore a brother or sister who is giving himself or herself to something other than to God our Father. When we love and care for someone, we admonish them, reminding a brother and ourselves the amazing love and grace of our Father. When we love and care for our brothers and sisters, we admonish them, challenging them to look more and more like Christ regardless of the situation. When we love and care for our brothers in Christ, we continue to speak the full counsel of God's word in their life. So we must understand the heart of admonishment. If we don't realize the heart behind it, if we're not walking in love, if we're not walking in care for one another, then we're simply being legalistic, saying right from wrong, and ultimately hurting our brother and sister. So now that we see the heart behind admonishment, the next thing I want us to look at in here is that God has told, given us an understanding that there is wisdom in admonishment. It says in verse 28, We proclaim Him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. See, an admonishment is, just, is not just a thought. Admonishment is not an opinion. Admonishment is not a preference. Have you ever had somebody speak an opinion, a thought, or a preference as if they're trying to speak God's word to you? Let me just tell you that our words and our opinions and our preferences are not God's word. God's word will never return void. See, we're called to walk in wisdom and our admonishment of one another. And where is wisdom found? In the word of God. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6. In Proverbs chapter 2, it tells us that true wisdom comes from the Word. It says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, For the Lord gives wisdom, from His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So where do we admonish from? It's not opinions, it's not thoughts, it's not preferences. It's not just telling someone like it is. It's not just saying the hard things. It's not just speaking just to be heard. No, we admonish according to the word of God in all wisdom. Wisdom comes from God, from his word. Matthew 7, he who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise builder. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, which also is one of the few times throughout the New Testament where the word admonishment is spoken. And in Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. Let the word of God dwell richly in you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So how do we admonish a brother? We do it through the word of God. Hey, listen, I love you. I care for you. And the word of God says that that what you're doing is not right. I want you to see that, that, that the enemy is trying to sell you just a whole bunch of things. And the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But God's come to give you life. Let me share with you about the Word of God. Let's open it up. Let's speak the Word of God. You know, the Scripture tells us to encourage one another. It tells us to encourage one another uh, all the time. 
The scripture tells us to pray for one another. The scripture tells us to, to continue to instruct and lift up one another to the building up. That's part of admonishment. Instructing and teaching. Admonishing is properly done when it's according to God's word. And so we know that we must speak God's word in admonishment, but we must also speak it according to God's word. And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, we see how to do this in accordance to his word. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it tells us that when, when, we, uh, when a brother is caught in trespass, you who are spiritual, to restore such a one in the spirit of what? Gentleness. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us in, in gentleness. Well, where does gentleness come from? John 15 says that he who abides in me will bear much fruit. Galatians 5 tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. So we can't admonish our brother with the word of God unless we're abiding in Christ and bearing fruit through our lives. Because otherwise, we're just going to give them intellectual knowledge. But when we're walking according to the word of God, we can come in with gentleness. And why? Because it says even in verse 1 of chapter 6 of Galatians, it says, so that you too will not be what? Tempted. So we must realize that we are called to admonish from a heart of love and care. We're called to admonish solely with the word of God. We must stop trying to admonish one another with your own personal view, opinion, or preference. So the last one I want to look at is the responsibility of admonishment. Who's called to admonish? Well, we see all throughout the New Testament that Paul is kind of the chief admonish, uh, or admonisher. He's the one who constantly is admonishing the church. But we see in the scripture in First and Second Thessalonians that he is calling the pastors to lead and to admonish, the uh, elders to lead and to admonish. And you may be saying, okay, that's good, David. That's what you need to do as a pastor. Oh, but wait. Look at Romans chapter 15, verse 14. It's not just for pastors. In Romans chapter 15, verse 14, it says, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourself are full of goodness, filled with knowledge, and able to admonish one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're called to love, to care for one another, to be counsel biblically to be in the word to walk rooted deeply in Christ bearing fruit and admonishing one another instructing guiding teaching and warning how often do you admonish a brother and sister how often have you been admonished by a brother or sister you know there's excuses out there Hey, David, I don't know the word well enough. And though I would accept that uh, excuse, except for the fact that if you don't know the word well enough, we need to be in the word of God. We've got to get in the word. The word's got to be in us. We've got to read the word. The word's got to read us. We have to be men and women who love this book. Like Jeremiah said, I found your words and I ate them. We have to be in this. It cannot be our excuse that I don't admonish because I don't know the word. We must be in the word. But you know the number one excuse that we give for not admonishing one another? Is that we're concerned about somebody's reaction. We're concerned about what they're going to say or how they're going to respond. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, God will not be mocked, you shall reap what you sow. Where in the scripture does it tell us that you and I are responsible for somebody else's reaction? What you and I are responsible for is our own action or lack of action. We're responsible for our own tongue and what we speak. 
When you say, well, God, I didn't admonish my brother or correct my brother or instruct my brother because I was fearful of their response, God's saying, when did their response become something that you need to hold on to? Now, you may be saying, so you mean to tell me, David, that we don't, we're not concerned about somebody's response and, and we're not concerned, you just told me to care for them. Yes, in John 15, when we are abiding in him and we are bearing much fruit, when you admonish a brother in Christ, you're doing it in gentleness, in humility, in love, and care for them. Are you not concerned for them? Absolutely. See, we can't. Tell God any longer, I'm not going to correct or instruct my brother because I'm fearful of their response. If you were driving down a road, or let me say it this way, if I'm driving down a road and you know that the bridge is out, and you know that if I keep going down the road that my car is going to crash off the bridge, can you fathom saying, well, God, I just didn't know how David would respond. So I didn't tell him. You know, God, I, uh, I love David, but uh, I, I just didn't tell him. Do, do you really love me if you let me keep driving, knowing that there is a bridge out in front of me and not warning or telling me? Do you really care for me? See, we're called to admonish one another because we care and love for each other. We must remove the excuse of being fearful of how somebody is going to respond or react. If you lovingly and gently come to a brother and share with them the truth, and they continue to run that way, your heart will be broken because you're longing for them to stop giving themselves to the enemy. Come back to the one who loves you, and that's God. But if they do come back and they're restored to Christ, you know what the scripture says? We rejoice. I've, I've admonished people in my life, and when they return to Christ, we're weeping together, rejoicing. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing. It's His redemptive work. But you know, we also have a responsibility to receive admonishment, to receive instruction, correction, teaching, and warning. You know what our natural response is? To walk in the flesh and in pride. Our natural response is to withdraw. Simply end the discussion. Leave the situation. Or the opposite. To escalate it. Add fuel to the fire. Respond with anger and intensity. Or take a negative interpretation. Assuming that they meant to hurt me. They were just saying that because they wanted to hurt me. Or even the invalidation. Defying, denying the significance of what they're sharing. We must realize that all of us are sinners saved by grace. And naturally, somebody's going to speak admonishment incorrectly. We must remember that it's God's word spoken by imperfect people. When somebody admonishes you and you think that they're doing it incorrectly, you need to say, well, is, is the word of God being spoken here? And if so, I need to let that wash over my life. Having an imperfect mouthpiece does not exempt you from the word of God that was spoken over you. We must ask God to show us which part of the admonishment is true and which is not. And we must respond in humility and gentleness. As Ephesians 4 tells us, so that we can preserve the bond of unity. See, God has called us within community to admonish faithfully. We're called to love and care for one another. We're called to to speak into one another's lives the word of God. We must follow what God is speaking in his command. This is not tell people how it is. This is not anger and frustration and And I'm just going to tell them, no, this is a true love for your brother, a true love for your sister, truly caring for them. And I pray that brothers 
would speak into my life, if they saw me walking off the ledge. And I pray that that's who we would be. Men and women truly living in community together with one another. Make it your aim in the next week to grow in Christ and to help someone else grow in Him. It's hard work to love, to truly love our brother and sister and to love people in Jesus. It says this in verse 29, For this purpose I labor, striving according to His power. Are you laboring and striving daily according to God's power? You know, that, that's a paradox. We labor and strive, but it's God's power. We must not just labor and strive, but we must actively, in the strength and power of God, pursue one another relationally, confess our sins to one another, admonish one another faithfully. That's what true community is all about. If we know him, if we know God, we love him. If we know him and we love him, we'll grow in him. If we grow in him, we'll show how to live for him. And if we know, grow, and show, we're going to go for him and tell others about the abundant life in Christ. Would you faithfully admonish Would you pursue one another relationally? Would you confess to one another? Would you speak into one another's lives as we continue to run for the kingdom of God together as the body of Christ? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much and we praise your holy name. Oh, Father, I pray that we would listen and obey Father, as we begin to walk according to this word, for some of us, this is so new to us. We've spoken our opinion, preferences, and thoughts, but actually sitting down in love and care for a brother to guide and walk with them is different. It's new. So let us start with a heart for each person brother and sister in Christ. Let us start by abiding in you. Let us start by realizing that the source of life is you and that we're called to reflect your image and to reflect your character. And Father, let us begin to see one another as family. And let us walk admonishing each other faithfully so that we may be complete in you. For it's in your name. Amen. At this time, this is when we normally would take of our offering. And you'll see on the screen that there's three ways that you can give to Luke 4.18 while we are in phase one. You can give online through the, uh, through the website. You can mail it in to 2664 Solly Road, uh, Mobile, Alabama, 36695. Or during office hours, you could drop off an offering, a tithe uh, to the church office. You know, these are unique days that we're walking through. And as we close today, I want to just share with each of you my heart about what's happening with COVID-19 and what's even happening with us having uh, going back to phase one. You know, these are unique and unprecedented days. I was thinking the other day that I've only uh, seen the church doors shut once or twice in my life for a hurricane. And in my first seven months as pastor, uh, we've been in phase one, which is online only, for over half of those first seven months. So to say that these are unique days, or it's an understatement. These, it isn't a unique day. And as I think about all of it, there's times that I'm disappointed because I long to be in here with each of you. Just two weeks ago, we made the decision to go back to phase one, to online only. 
The main purpose of that, as I shared in my email and also in the video that we posted, was because of the rise of cases and hospitalizations here in our city, in Mobile. Now, we moved kind of quickly because I found out and another pastor on uh, the leadership team found out that we were both exposed to the virus. Praise God, both of us uh, tests have come back negative. We were praying through and even thinking about the following week, but on Saturday or Friday when I found that out, we felt that it was best and safe for the whole body for us to go back to phase one that Saturday. People have asked me, David, when will we move back to phase two? And, and I don't know that answer. I'm continuing to seek the Lord with the trustees. We even met this past week. And, and while we were, were meeting, even then we saw that one of the highest days of COVID-19 in Mobile was that day. You know, many have shared with me their disappointment about the doors being shut at the church house. And I want you to hear that it's not wrong for you to have an emotion of sadness or an emotion of disappointment. Because God created us with our emotion. You know, there's not even a, there's not one bad emotion. You may say, David, what about anger and fear? Well, God said to be angry and do not sin. And God said to fear him. So it's okay for us to have that feeling. But I want to share with you that while we are walking through these days, we have to be very careful how we speak. See, I've heard many people ask and say, David, when is the church going to open? When are we going to open the church? And I want you to hear that the church has never closed. In Acts chapter 2, the church was founded at Pentecost when God put his sanctuary in the hearts of believers. In that moment, the church was founded. The church has gone through oppressive governments. The church has gone through viruses and sicknesses and illnesses. The church has gone through uh, just false religion. And even through all of those things, the church has never closed. And it's still alive today. There's no pastor, no oppressive government, and no demon in hell that can close God's church. If, if there was, then our God is not all-powerful. And so we must be careful when we ask, hey, when's the church going to open? Because the church has never closed. The decision was made for a short time to close the doors of the church house. You know, I've been sharing with you for the past three years. And some have thought, well, maybe David's just playing with words here, but I really meant it is that we're the body of Christ, and this is just a building. So we have to be careful not saying, I'm going to church, because we are the church. We have to be careful about calling this building the church, because you and I are the church. See, if our emotion of sadness and, and disappointment is then placed with a thought that the church has closed, which is not biblical because it hasn't closed, then that's going to bring about an action of sin. An unbiblical thought is going to, that, that has then rested in your heart, can easily bring about an action of sin. That sin is murmuring, complaining, and even false accusations. And so we must be careful that we speak God's word. Church, we have an incredible opportunity. I continue to tell people, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I can't tell you how excited I am to pastor even during these just unprecedented days. Because every day is a day that God has given us to be the church. We have such an incredible opportunity to share with people that the church is never closed. 
We have such an incredible opportunity to let people know that this is just a building. And even though for a short time we're not in that building, the church is still alive and well. We have an incredible opportunity to let people know that our unity is not based on a building, but our unity is based on the Holy Spirit. God shared with me many times that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest right now is plentiful. And the way that our culture is going to change and see Christ is not whether the doors of the church house is open or close. It's whether you and I continue to live out as the body of Christ, as the church, reflecting the image and the character of God. That doesn't mean that we don't have disagreements. That doesn't mean that we don't have times that we think that it needed to be done a different way. But praise God, as the body of Christ, we come together, we sit down, we open the word, and we pray together and talk together through it. What an incredible opportunity that we have right now to proclaim to the world that the church in the midst of COVID-19 is alive and well because the church has been, because God has placed his sanctuary within us. We're the body. We're the church. What our nation needs more than ever right now is to see the body of Christ reflecting the image and the character of our God, of our Father. Church, I love you. You all mean so much to me and my family. It's an honor and a joy to walk with each of you. I truly care and love for each as I just shared about in my message. And I look forward to what God is doing today, what he's doing in the body, and how he's using us to be his hands and feet, reflecting his image and his character. Church, I love you dearly. May we continue to be the light that's shining through us for this world to see. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he give you the shalom, the peace of God.